thank you for the privilege of coming to your presence here in Litu, there in Litu, changing us, shaping us for your pleasure, to the kind of people you want us to be as we look into your word today. Oh Lord, chisel out of our lives whatever is unpleasant unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have us as a masterpiece for you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 This month, by the grace of God, there is no specific uh, theme. We're just going to be looking at a few things that can help us in our Christian life. And to start with, we're going to look at today discovering, discovering our Christian identity. There are so many believers that they are not their best for God because of what we call an identity crisis. And it's a big problem in the world today. But for you to live, to really be who God wants you to be, you need to have a Christian identity. You need to understand who you are in Christ. Otherwise, you will be tossed to and fro and eventually you will not really be your best for God. So as we look at this message, I want you to look at your life. The message is not attacking anybody. We are just looking at the scripture so that we can develop our best self. You want to be your best your best for Christ, your best, very, very important. Identity crisis is a great plague in the modern world. It's not only in the church, in the world generally. Men are dressing like women, calling themselves transvestites. You know, in Nigeria, Bobriski has gotten into so many problems. This is a, a, a man that has now changed herself, dressing like a woman and go, and now they call her Mama Lagos. What a shame. You are born a man, named a man, raised like a man. You now become an adult to say no. I think I want to be a woman. It's an identity crisis. You are not, you are not grateful for the way God created you. And the same way also, there are women who want to look like men, who want to behave like men. Men are changing sex to become women, calling themselves transgender. You know, the ones that dress like women and go. Those ones are transvestites. They prefer wearing skirt and doing this and wearing wig and going out and you know going to be you know a, a lot of things like that. But there are some that will even go ahead to want to change their you know body and, and go grow breast and this all, all other things. They call them transgender. Again, identity crisis. Identity crisis lies at the very root of the LGBTQ plus movement. All this lesbian, gay, you know, bisexual, transvestite, queer, you know, they have so many varieties. But identity crisis lies at the root of that movement. The person who is not sure of his identity will be swept away by the flood of identity crisis and dysfunctionality. If you are not sure of your identity, you will be swept away. People will make you feel inferior. I pray that the Lord himself will help us 
to discover our true identity in Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The, the believer has the responsibility to discover his true identity in Christ and rise to live up to it. Discover your identity in Christ and live like it is and live like it. And don't let anybody make you to feel any inferior, any less than what God has called you to be. Don't let Satan deprive you of who you are in Christ because it's important. Very, very important. Number one, let's look at the dysfunctionality through identity crisis. And this is not a psychology message. This is not a, an emotional message. This is hypo message because I will show you Genesis chapter 22. And it's not a it's not a recent it's not a recent problem, only that it has become an epidemic in our days. Genesis chapter 27, I read from verse 8. Go with me to that passage and let's begin to explore it. Genesis 27, verse 8. Now, therefore, my son, obey, no, sorry, Genesis. Genesis 26, I should think. Verse 8. Oh. It's still not. Okay. Genesis chapter 27. Let me read to you from verse 18, Genesis 27, verse 18. And he came unto his father and said, my father, and he said, here am I. Who art thou, my son? What a question. This was Jacob. He came to Isaac. And he said, oh, father, I have come. And then he said, who art thou, my son? What a deep question that is. Somebody said, well, it's just a normal question. No, it's more than a normal question. The question that Isaac asked Jacob is a very significant question. Who art thou, my son? Isaac called him his son. Your father calls you a son. Are you truly a son? What kind of son? A prudent son or a profligate son? A faithful son? Or an unfaithful son. We want to know. Who art thou, my son? Isaac has called Jacob his son. But he says, now use your mouth to tell me who you are. Because your father may see you as a son, or you must see yourself as a bastard. Who are you? My son, your pastor calls you a brother or a sister, thinking you are saved, assuming you are saved. But the question is, are you truly a brother? Or are you a wolf in sheep's skin? You are just in the church to catch a nice, cool, godly sister, so you need to pretend because you want to get married. And we say, brother so-and-so, 
For God says, this one is not a brother. This is a wolf in sheep clothing. Who are you, my brother? You need to answer that question for yourself. What kind of brother are you? A true or a false brother? You know Paul? Paul said, amongst false brethren. They claim to be brethren, but he found them to be false. Who are you, my brother? I call you brother, but tell us who you really are by yourself. That's very important. That's what, you know, this passage is telling us. Maybe you are on the platform this morning. Your wife calls you a husband. Say, but who are you a husband? Are you truly a husband or a community playboy? Are you faithful to that woman or you are running after everything in scared in the community? Who are you a husband? Are you a faithful husband or are you a cheating husband? Yes, she calls you a husband. What kind of husband? This question, who art thou my son? What a deep question. You know what we are learning today? What other people call us or how other people perceive us is not as important as who we truly are. I don't care what people call you. Who are you deep within you? Who truly are you when you are by yourself? That's important. Who are you? Let me show you something. You know how prophets used to dress? Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. I want to show you a few things about what we are talking about today. Very important. Hebrews 11, 37. The Bible says, they were, they were stole, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. He's talking about the prophets of old that were persecuted. And you see how they dress in sheepskins and goatskins. They draw very rough. Look at the scriptures in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. The true prophets, they didn't care too much about nice dressing. You know, Jesus was asking some people, said, concerning John the Baptist, he said, who did you go to see in the wilderness? Somebody with nice clothing in the king's palace or somebody with a rough clothing in the wilderness? So you went to see John and you know how he was. He was not you know, a sociable person for the palace. He was rough already, a rugged prophet in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, I read verse 4. The scripture says, and the same John had his raiment of camels here and the leather, leather gado about his loins and his meat was locust and wild honey. So you see how he dressed camels here and lengthy leather gado. But you know there are some people that they are not real prophets. But they don't want people to know they are not prophets. So they disguise themselves like prophets. How did they disguise themselves? Zechariah, in Zechariah, let's see it. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 4. This is the way they disguise. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 4. It tells us, and it shall come to pass in that day 
that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision. When he had, when he had prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. Because that's how the prophets used to dress in those days, rough garment. So somebody who is not a prophet, then he will put on rough garment and go out so that people can perceive him as a prophet, but he's not a prophet. And God says, that's going to stop. No wearing of wrong garment to deceive. You know, so, sometimes people put up an appearance because they want people to perceive them in a particular way, but they know that that's not who they are. That's dysfunctionality. That's deceit. And how many Christians are like that? They are one personality in the church. They are another personality in the world. You meet them in the church on Sunday. Ah, how are you, sister so-and-so? You meet them in the marketplace on Wednesday. I say, am I seeing double? Do I know? This person looks very familiar. But I, I think she is. But because in the church, she has dressed like Mary, the mother of Jesus. But on Wednesday, you meet her in the marketplace. She's no different from Jezebel. And you are wondering, it's a double identity. Be yourself, my brother. Be yourself, my sister. What you are in church on Sunday, let it be also what you are in the marketplace on Wednesday. No difference. The way you see me is the way I am everywhere. There are no two pastor Shola, it's only one. There's not a pastor Shola that presents an identity like this in church, another pastor Shola that this is who he is in his family, and another pastor Shola that this is the way he is at work. It's one. You know, there are some brethren who think that they are nice. Some sisters you say, I thank God for this sister. Maybe you don't know her. When she gets home, the way she harasses her children, the way she abuses her husband, only if you know you say, eh? Because this functionality, this person does not have a true identity. Have a true identity. Anywhere, anytime people meet you, the way you speak is the way you speak. Transparency, honesty, this is who you are. No, there are no, no attachments, no hidden, no hidden things. You are who you are. This is what you know the Lord wants. And I pray that it will be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very important. Don't be somebody somewhere and another individual, another place. No. Behold. Be saying. So, why should you wear a rock garment to deceive? If you're a prophet, be a prophet. If you're not a prophet, let people know you're not a prophet. Don't live a false life. But that's what happens. What other people call you or how people perceive you is not as important as you who you truly are. And the question is, who art thou? My son, Isaac calls you his son. But from your own perspective, who are you? A true son or a false son? A, a son indeed or a pastor? A faithful son or an unfaithful son? Who are you? That's important. You need to answer that question. The real you is not the public persona you project for the private individual in the heart. For the scripture tells us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Who you truly are is reflected in your heart, and you can't deceive anybody. You know that. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, 
So is he. Eat and drink. Say it to thee. But his heart is not with thee. He's inviting you to come and eat. But he's saying, I hope he will say no. Because I don't really want to give him out of this food. That's exactly who he is. He's not friendly. He's not hospitable. He's only putting up a front to show that he's friendly and hospitable. But the Bible says, if you want to truly know him, the way he is in his heart, that's the way he is. That's who you are. He's not who we call you to be. He's not who we perceive you to be. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you are thinking dirty in your heart, you are dirty. If you are thinking crazy in your heart, you are crazy. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Even though you are trying to show you are decent, but God knows you are not decent because the heart is defiled. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's why what you think of yourself, your true identity in your heart is more important than the perception of people, than what people call you. Who are you? You know, I was telling some people, after what happened, happened two years ago, somebody looked at me and said, Pastor Shola, once you leave this church, you are finished. I looked at the person. I said, you don't understand. You can take Jacob's, I mean, you can take Joseph's cloak, any colors from him, but you cannot take the values in the heart of Joseph that actually makes him who he is. His brothers took his coat of many colors. They killed an animal. They put blood on it and they killed the father and said, Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Is this not his coat of many colors? They stripped him of his coat of many colors. But the value of Joseph is not in the cloth. The value of Joseph is in his heart. And you cannot strip him of that. He got to Potiphar's house. That value came out. Holiness. Wisdom, diligence, you can see it. He was told in prison, compassion. God was still with him until he got to the palace. That's why when somebody is real, you, you can take every outside thing from him. That, that, that's not what defines him. What defines him is he who he is. You know, if I was a person that depended on Ah, they call me national overseer. They call me southern European overseer. When those titles are taken from you, you collapse. Because those are the things that are keeping you up. But no, what keeps me up is the true value in my heart. I'm bigger than titles. You take titles away from me, I will still be who I was yesterday. Because my value, you can't take my value from me. You can, that's why the Bible says that keep your heart with all the images because out of your heart are the issues of life. The issues of life flows from the heart. As you think in your heart, so you are. That's why when some people lose their titles, they, they go into depression because that's what gives them value. The external title that somebody confers on them, not the internal person that they are. But when you meet somebody, whose value is from his heart. You can take everything away from him. Take money, take title, take honor, take every, anything you want. He will still be himself. Because what defines him is not the external things that were put on him. What defines him is from his heart. I want you that what will define you must be what comes from your heart, from your inside. Not the title people give you, title of pastor, title of regional overseer, title of national overseer, title of capo at the place of work. That's not what defines you. What defines you is your real value in your heart, your real identity. 
And it doesn't matter what happens all around you. That identity is protected. You will still feel and feel valuable, irrespective of what is happening, because your value is right inside you. So I told that individual, you say I'm finished because I'm leaving, you know, the church for, for genuine reasons. I am not finished because I don't function on the basis of title. I function on the basis of the value in my heart. And that value is still there. You can't take it away from me. You strip me of the, of the coat of many colors. You strip me of the title. You can't strip me of my value. And that value, and you can see by God's grace in the last two years, how that value has been coming out. That value has been coming out. Comes out in Bible study. Comes out in, uh, you know, in the Tuesday master class. Comes out when we do conferences. Comes out as we impact people. Comes out as we are establishing new churches. I told the post, I didn't hear it anything. By God's grace, the churches that were here, we planted them. Oh, when the millionaire loses his money, it's not a disaster. Because the skills that generated the money in the first place, the millionaire still has those skills. Give him time. One year, two years, three years, he will recreate the wealth. Because the same skills that he used to create that wealth that he has lost, those skills are still with him. That's what makes him. That's what people don't realize. The same way, don't live a false life, my brother. Don't project personality that this is who you are. Then you project to be somebody else. When everything crumbles, when those external things crumble, you will go depressed. You will crumble. That's why people commit suicide. Because when those external props are removed, they, they feel empty. They feel useless. They feel valueless. And they think they have to take their lives away. And they commit suicide. Because their value is not coming from inside. You know what I'm saying today? Let your value come from inside. Let your value come from inside. That's important. People may reject you. That doesn't matter. Rejection is nothing. Because who you are is who you are. Rejection is just somebody's opinion. Who you are is what you are. That's important, my brother. That's important, my sister. And I'm praying that the Lord himself will help us to follow suit in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So who are you, my son? That was Isaac's question to Jacob. And Jacob has to answer that question. And the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He is not who people perceive him to be. He is not who people say he is. He is as he thinks in his heart. What do we learn? One of the pro pro major problems today in the world is identity crisis. This is why a Peter wants to change sex and become a Patricia. Some others don't even know whether they are male or female and prefer to be labeled neutral, neutral gender and be addressed as Zah. I, I don't know if you understand that now, in the world now, to be politically correct, it's not only male and female. There are some people that... They say they are not male, they are not female. They want to be addressed as a new gender. So if you call them Mr., they say, who is Mr.? If you call them Miss or Mrs., they say, are you seeing me? You call me Zer, Z-I-R. That's how the world is getting crazy. And now organizations are defined, are designing forms. When they feel form now, you know before, when they define, they develop form, they will say, answer the one that is not necessary. Mr., Mrs., or Miss. Now, Za is there also. Is the world not going crazy? No. Is it not identity crisis? A man is born a man, a male. Somebody is born male. 
said, I don't know whether I'm male or female, but I want to be called a new gender. Call me Za. A woman is, I mean, a person is born female, and then she's sewing. Uh, I don't even know, even though uh, I feel as if I'm a woman, but I don't think so. Uh, and, I, uh, and I don't think I'm a man. Call me Za. Is the world not going crazy? It's an identity crisis. Big, big crisis. And it's in the world today, and it's growing. And you're going to see how people are going to be going more and more crazy because people, they, they don't realize identity, recognizing your identity, very, very important. The high level of dysfunctionality in modern society has its roots in identity crisis. Although Jacob identified himself as Esau. Now, let's go back to that Genesis. Genesis chapter 27, verse 18. Let's read the story. And let's begin to see this identity crisis. Genesis 27, verse 18. And he came unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. Is he Esau? No. And why is he calling himself Esau? Was he the firstborn? No. He's the secondborn. And why is he calling himself Esau? Hey, identity crisis. Maybe he woke up on the, on the other side of the bed. This person wants to deceive and he must present to be who he is not. That's why he said, I am Esau. Are you Esau? No. I thought we know you that you are Jacob. He said, no, I am Esau. Identity crisis. Don't you know yourself again? Of course he does. It's a problem. Mm. And Esau. And let's go. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison that my soul, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Lies. As he said, go and, go and kill bush meat and bring it, dress it. Let me eat and just enjoy it and bless you. That's what he told his son. And Jacob didn't go anywhere. He killed one of his own animal and he has roasted it. And, he and, and Isaac said, this your hunting is so fast. How come? He said, thy Lord brought it to me. Lies. No God that brought it to you. Everything is cooked up. Then verse 21. And Isaac said unto Jacob, come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou art thou be my very son Esau or not. Isaac began to have some suspicion. The time is too quick. The voice I'm hearing. But they already knew because Jacob had this. Jacob had a smooth skin, but Esau was hearing. So when they were preparing, the mother had taken the hair of the goat or that they killed and put it on Jacob's hand that your father may, may suspect. So he touched it 
And then he said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hand is the hand of Esau. He was puzzled. Verse 23, and he discerned him not because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau, Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Are thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. How can you be telling lies? This is very naked lies. You are Jacob. As you are Esau and you dress like Esau you even put on the garments of Esau now look at verse 25 and he said bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's venison that my soul may bless thee and he brought it near to him and he did eat and he brought him wine and he drank and his father Isaac said unto him Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord had blessed. You know what happened? He wore the clothes of Esau. So that he smelled like Esau. Esau was an hunter. So those clothes would smell of the hunting. And it covered its uh, own body odor. And it did. And when the people smelled it, all what it was smelling was his. But the voice was the voice of Jacob. He had this dysfunctionality through identity crisis. And there are many people like that today. They dress for show, they dress for deceit. You see them the way they dress, that's not who they are. They are deadly. They are just dressing for you to perceive them the way they want you to perceive them. But deep down, they are somebody else. They are something else. Isn't that how some women get into traps? They see a man who is generous, they ask for this amount of money. He gives them 1,000 euro. He gives them to Konku. I have some challenge. How much do you need? 2,000 euro. He gives them. He, he looks generous. You don't know what he does. My sister, until you fall to be a sacrifice, some of these people are people. He's doing that for you to see him as generous and move near. The day is going to use you for morning ritual. You will regret your life. Is somebody else is wicked to the heart, but he wants people to see him as generous and kind. It's a different thing. These are dysfunctional people. This is Jacob who wants to be perceived and seen as Esau. Is somebody else? but he wants to be seen as somebody else. That's important. So what do we learn here? Although Jacob identified himself as Esau, but Isaac declared that the identification does not add up. The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hand is that of Esau. You know what we learn from there? The hand of Esau speaks of work, of labor, going out to hunt. The voice of Jacob speaks of language. Do you know one thing in the world? When a person is consistent, his language and his labor will add up. You cannot be a hunter. You are forever at home. Your language and your labor they are not consistent. You cannot be a Jacob by voice and be a Esau in labor. There's no problem. That's a problem. It's dysfunctionality. Labor and language always agree. I want you to see that. 
Labor and language always agree. When you read the Proverbs chapter, chapter 7, you see a, a prostitute that went out. Go and read that passage. You will see the language. She's a prostitute. That's the labor. But what kind of language is she using? And is that not consistent with, 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 the, with, with the work? Yes. Seduction and prostitution, they are consistent. Seductive language and the, the work of a prostitute, that's the only way she can get clients. They are consistent. Have you seen a scammer telling you truth? No. Scammers have to deceive you. Scammers have to tell lies. That's the way they get their work done. And scammers and lies, they are partners. Scammers and falsehood, they are, that's consistent. But you know also, a pastor and truth is also consistent. Look at Malachi chapter, chapter 2. Let me just read the passage as we go on. So language and labor must be consistent. Malachi chapter 2 in verse 7. For the priest's lips, the pastor's lips, to keep knowledge, and they should seek the Lord at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. The pastor must preach the truth. When the pastor preaches lies, there's no cause, there's a dysfunctionality there. A priest is meant to keep knowledge, and people should seek the Lord of God at his mouth. He should be, you know, you know, somebody, a messenger, you know, dispensing truth. You're, once you are able to analyze something and the language and the labor, they don't add up. Progress can never be made. Take a community. Do you, if you look at the African community, do you know why the African community has not moved on very, very much? Language and labor. A has one opinion. B has a different opinion. C has a different opinion. In the community, we don't have a unified language of how to move forward. And because of that, nothing works. That's important. Have you seen, you know, you know what I said here? A doctor cannot speak in the language of an engineer. A doctor must speak in the language of a doctor. A banker will not speak in the language of a miner. A banker must speak in financial terms. The miner will be talking about, you know, the tons of uh, gold that the two can go. A banker will not speak in the language of a miner. John the Baptist, you know, except there is a great agreement between labor and language, there will be great dysfunctionality. John the Baptist, he knew his identity and declared, declared it in no uncertain terms. Let's see John chapter 1. I want you to see that and you must put your life on the line. Can you be like this? Your language and your labor do they tally? John chapter 1 verse 19. And this is the record of John of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? I thought they knew him. Yes, they knew him as John the Baptist. They think he's a prophet, but they want him to declare, Who art thou? My brother on the platform, I know your name. I presume you are a believer. But today, the question is, who art thou? Answer by yourself. My sister, I call you sister, and I respect you. I think you are born again. But that's not the issue. Who are you? That's what they told John the Baptist, verse 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not a Jacob that will say I am Esau. No, I'm consistent. 
I'm John the Baptist. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Jesus. I am John the Baptist. So, but confess I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are thou? Are thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Are thou that prophet? And he answered, no. They want to put words in his mouth. If you say you are not Jesus, are you Elijah? Elijah? He said, no. Are you that prophet that is to come? He said, no. Then, verse 22, then said they unto him, who are that? They got, okay, tell us who you are. Don't tell us who you are not. You are not Jesus. Okay. You are not Elijah. All right. You are not the prophet that should come. But who are you? They, they, they got frustrated. In verse 22, they said unto him, who are thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. They came to ask him. And then he said, yes, let me tell you who I am. I'm the one, I'm the forerunner of Jesus. I came as prophesied by, by Isaiah. And I came to make straight the way of the Lord. The person if you read, our time has gone. If you read, he said, I don't even know who the Messiah was. But the person that sent me, God that sent me, he told me what to look for. He said, I will be baptizing in water. I will be baptizing in water. But one day, one will come. As you are baptizing in the water, the heavens will open. The Spirit of God will descend upon him. When you see that, that is the Messiah. And John the Baptist said, and... I saw and bore witness that this is the Son of God. And ministry was accomplished. That day came. Jesus came to be baptized. The heavens opened. And the Spirit of God descended upon him. And God said, this is my beloved Son. Here he is. John the Baptist had been looking for that sign for a long time. And the day the sign happened, he didn't miss it. He was there and he said, I bear witness that this is the Son of God. Are you the bridegroom? He said, No. The bridegroom is the person who has the bride. I don't have the bride. I'm the best man. And my joy is that the bridegroom has taken the bride. That's my joy. He must increase, I must decrease. John the Baptist was real to the core. My brother be real to the core. My sister be real to the core. Don't say who you are not. Don't say who you are. It does not demean you. Who you are is who you are. Are you Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you that prophet? No. Then who are you? He told them who he is, simply. Be proud of your identity. Discover your identity. Don't be somebody that is carrying a fake identity all around. You know there are some people, they've never gone to university. You look at a lot of African politicians. They never went to university. They'll say, I graduated from so-so-so university in Houston, Texas. Sometimes when you trace the name, even the university does not exist. Who are they taking for a right? When people go to investigate, even the university that is claiming does not exist, it is that people will not investigate. And you know one of our politicians that said he graduated from a particular university, eventually people got in touch with the university. The university said, we don't have any name like this on our register since we, we started. And this, the person is claiming, I graduated from that university, the university said, we don't know anything about him. We don't have any record of him. He never came to this university. What if you didn't go to university? What does it matter? Bill Gates didn't go to university. He dropped out first year in Stanford. But he's still Bill Gates, respected in the world. Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg didn't go to university. But he's still the owner of Facebook and is respected. And they don't go around. So that people, I went to this university that they didn't go. 
Don't fake things. Be yourself. Are you Jesus? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you that prophet that is to come? No. Then who are you? They tell them who you are. Simple, straightforward. Don't live a fake life. There are so many people that live a fake life. You know, I watched a video on the internet. Very shocking. A man married a woman. The woman was like, you know, very beautiful. But it was all fake. After the marriage, when they got home, removed wig, what? No hair, only remove their clothes, remove the things the person used to pop the breast, remove it. Everything was flat. The person is looking. At the end of the day, this man has married another man. <laughs> the person collapsed. It was all fake. But if you see the person, very beautiful woman, but it was all fake, all fake. Even the face was, was baked and it removed. It was like a mask, remove it, remove that, remove this. The one she used to pass the pack, pack the, 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 the bottle, removed it, all those plastic, soft plastic. The, the man didn't know that all what you have been touching was plastic, rubber, but done in such a way that it's like, it's like flesh. Why are you deceiving people? Be yourself. Why are you going to be Jacob and be claiming to be Esau? And going all the way to put clothes, Esau's clothes on, to put a uh, goat skin on your body so that the identity you are, you are, you are faking, nobody will discover that it's a fake. Be yourself. It's dysfunctionality. And it's because of identity crisis. How can you be Jacob and you are claiming to be to be Esau? You have an identity crisis. But I pray the Lord Himself will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Except there is a great agreement between labor and language that can be, you no, know, there will be great dysfunctionality. John the Baptist knew his identity and declared it in no uncertain terms. Jesus taught as a person with authority. You know what the Bible says? He didn't teach as the scribes. He taught as somebody who had authority. He didn't teach as the scribes. Be yourself. Teach. Don't be anybody's echo. Don't be anybody's carbon copy. Be an original. Amen? Amen. Amen. How to preach like Pastor Shona, be yourself. Preach the word. The instant in season and out of season. Don't be a carbon copy of anybody, the original. Be yourself. Don't be an echo of anybody. Be an original voice. And when you have your true identity, you will not be ashamed to be who, who God made you to be. That's who you are. So women are short. And then they will go and put on high heels that can almost destroy them. When they get back home from the function they've gone, all the tendons on their on their leg, everything is paining them. My sister, why do you put yourself through that kind of aggro? Just because you want to be a little bit taller and go. Be yourself. God knows the way He's created you. You are wonderful, my sister. You are beautiful, my sister. It's great. Be yourself. Don't live, don't live to impress the world. Live to satisfy and please God. And that will be okay. Be yourself. Let's see the second point. Dominion through identity correction. Self-identification is very important. Who are thou? 
They asked John the Baptist, identify yourself. Isaac asked who are thou, my son? Self identification is very important. Identity crisis will lead to retention of a false persona. That's what will happen. If you have an identity crisis, you want to be who you are not. Somebody has not seen you for maybe five years. Where have you been? For about two years, I was in London. And you never went anywhere. My brother, why the lies? I was two years in London. This person has been in uh, Isaleiko. Only that nobody saw you. My brother, what, what stops you to say I've been around? I mean, this has been a bit of oh, God is there. God is helping me to come out of it. What is it going on? I mean, you want to impress. You know, many of us want to impress people who are not impressed. After they go from, away from you, they will criticize you and say, that stupid one is telling me he went to London. London, come. Just be yourself. Dominion through identity correction. I mean, you're on the platform tonight, I mean, today, and this is one of your problems. You need to start correcting yourself. You need to start that the Lord himself will help you be who you are. Correction of identity is essential if there is to be progress, except there is a great agreement in language there can be no progress in labor as regards communal identity. Consider the Tower of Babel because there was no agreement in language. The labor fell to pieces. You remember, there were a community, the Tower of Babel, and God said, these people are so united. This tower they want to build to heaven, they will build it and nothing will happen. What did God do? He scattered their language. Bring me a brick. It will bring a. It will bring a, a shovel, and that one will be angry. Did you hear me? Are you are, are you deaf? Okay. Can you bring me that trowel? It will bring him water. Say what is wrong with you? And their language. They, there was no agreement in language. The Bible says everything is scattered. That's why Africans we are not united. A is saying this. B is saying that, C is saying that, no unity in language, no. That's why we cannot work together. Nothing works. If there is no agreement in language and you know, there can be no labor, it will be destroyed. The language of the voice of Jacob and the hand of Esau, they don't work. There must be consistency. It must be the voice of Jacob and the hand of Jacob, the voice of Esau and the hand of Esau. But when you begin to mix it, the voice of Jacob and the hand of Esau, no progress will be made. That's what happened at the, at the, at, at the time of Babel. Confusion of language was of necessity lead to confusion of labor, whereas unity of language will lead to focus of labor for the common good. Why did they create the United Nations? So that the world, the group of nations, Greek of nations, have a common vision, a common focus for the progress of the world. Although it's not working perfectly the way, the way they want it, that's why they created it. Let's come together and find a common path. We issue a common directive. We say we agree on a common way to, to work and to go. That's how progress is made. Maybe you are in the family, maybe you are here today and your family is dysfunctioning, dysfunctional. You know why? Husband will say this, wife will say that, and you are, and you are worried that your family is not being good. There cannot be progress. How can the husband say this and the wife say this? You are not focused. 
you are not going in the same way. That's important. And if that is the case, there can be no, no progress. We need to understand that progress is made when all of us page. But when we are not on the same page, there can be no progress. That's important. Hmm. Somebody said, okay, Pastor, what are we going to do? Well, identity correction. Very important. Jesus met a man in John chapter 5, verse 6. Our time is gone. But you know what Jesus Christ asked him? Will thou be made whole? This man had been sick for 38 years. But the question came. Will thou be made whole? Can I apply the same question to those who are on the platform today and you are having an identity crisis? Will you allow your fractured identity to be repaired and made whole? Will you allow your crooked identity to be made straight? The Bible says that every crooked part will be made straight. Every valley Will you allow the crooked identity to be made straight? Living with identity crisis is like sowing among thorns. There can be no profitable harvest. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. When you have an identity crisis, oh, the future, there is no future. So to say, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. The Bible says, For thus said the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among tongues. Why is God counseling them to sow not among tongues? If you sow among tongues, as the thing is going, the tongues will choke them up. Matthew chapter 13, there will be no harvest. It's wasted effort. And when you live with identity crisis, it's like sowing among thorns. There will be no harvest. No profitable harvest. You need to break up the fallow ground of identity crisis, effect the necessary correction for proper progress to commence. Genuine repentance and forsaking of sin is fundamental. If crooked Zacchaeus is to change, Remember, Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus came to Jesus and said, Half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. I'm not going to be charitable. And if I've taken anything from any man, he had been crooked before, but now he wanted his life to be straight. And he said, The people have cheated, I'm going to do restitution. Now, I didn't care for anybody before, I'm going to be caring and generous. Repentance. Sin lies at the root of identity crisis. There must be real repentance. Need to forsake sin. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how the public can pray. That's how we need to pray today. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He that you know covereth his sins shall not prosper. But to so confess it and forsake them shall have mercy. There will be divine mercy. Amen. You will the correction of your identity, repentance. If you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repentance. Are you on the platform? Your, your, your wife thinks that she's satisfying you. Your wife thinks that she's a very good wife and she's uh, giving you fulfillment. But my brother, you are always on the internet into pornography sites. Your wife doesn't know. You are projecting a completely different image. You are getting satisfaction from pornography, but you are making your wife to to know that she's the one that is giving you that satisfaction. You are dysfunctional. 
You are not true to yourself. Correct that identity. Forsake pornography. Forsake sin. Very important. So dominion through identity correction. But identity correction can never come when there is no repentance. It's only God that can, that can help you and to restore you back to your true identity. And I pray that the Lord himself will do it in Jesus' name. Yeah. And after, what do we find? Discovery of our identity in Christ. Discover your identity in Christ. Following repentance and forsaking of sin, the saved individual needs to put off the old man that is corrupt and to put on the new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 tells us. Put off the old man. It's correct. Put off the crooked behavior. Put off all those uh, pretensions and acting. Put on the new man. Be genuine. Be real. Tell the truth. Don't project a false identity. Let people see you the way you are. There is no sin in it. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Let's read a few verses. Who are you? Who are thou, my son? When you want to answer somebody, your first answer should be, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be, not, be ye not equally yoked together with all believers. And what did he say in verse 17? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, say the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. If you will forsake sin, if you will forsake and repent, you know what God says? You'll be called a daughter of God. You'll be called a son of the Almighty. And that's our first identity in Christ. Son of God. Daughter of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. What again is your identity? And live like a son. And live like a daughter. You cannot be a daughter of son and want to dress like a daughter of the devil. My sister, he is not consistent. So people will say that eh, I'm a believer. I've given my life to Christ. And my sister, you come to church. All the breasts are out. Everything that ought to be private is public. No. There should be consistency. If you're a child of God, let's see you dressed in modesty. You know, not being a temptation to the opposite sex. Very important. You can't be a daughter of God and dress like an agent of Satan. No. Stop consistent. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit is said, bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But apart from being children of God, verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, if so be that we suffer with him, then that we may also be glorified, also glorified together. It says, we are not just sons and daughters of God, we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. You know an heir? You won't see the daughter of a binomia behave like the daughter of a pauper. She lives in that heritage. You won't see the son of a president living as he is the son of a pawan tapa in the village. No, he will live in the privilege of being the son of the president. You are an heir of God. Live like an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Christ. Live like you are a joint heir with Christ. Number three, we are regents of God on earth, exercising authority and dominion. 
when God created man, he created man in his own image. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and have dominion. You know why? Because you are God's representative on earth. Jesus said, have you not read that it is written in your law that you are God's small g? God is the great God in devil with a capital G. We are small gods on earth with small g. As God rules in heaven, we rule on earth. We are regents. Revelation chapter 1. Look at what God has made you. And it's a pity that believers, they want to be somebody else. I don't want to be anybody else. I want to be who God made me. Made me. I want to live in my heritage. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And hath made us. Let me read to you from verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's where we start. He washed us from our sins with his blood. But he didn't leave us there. Verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He didn't want to wash us from our sins with his blood. He made us kings and priests. My sister, he has made you a queen. Reign like a queen. Don't lower yourself. God made you a queen. A queen does not dress like a prostitute. Dress like a queen. Let there be, you know, dignity to your dressing. Dignity to your speaking. You won't see a queen ranting all around. No, you are a queen. My brother, he has made you to be a king. Let there be dignity to your dressing. Let there be dignity to your language. He has made us kings and priests unto him. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. It says, And hath made us unto our God, kings and priests. And we shall reign when we get to the earth. On the earth. What did he say? And we shall reign on the earth. On the earth. You know, some people say, and when we get to heaven, we will reign with Jesus. We will reign on the earth. There is no reigning in heaven. God reigns supreme. We are just enjoying with him and fellowship and sing songs to him. You reign here. He made you a king, a regent. He made you a small god here to have dominion and have authority and to reign. That's your identity. That's why when you know your identity, you don't want to be somebody else. Why do you want to be somebody else? I'm a king. Why do I want to be jealous of somebody else? I'm a priest. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm a son of God. I mean... What an identity. We are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. We don't have the time to read all that. God told Israel in Exodus chapter 19, this is what you are. And they are also now brought that from Exodus chapter, chapter 19 and said, what God spoke of the physical Israel, God has spoken of the spiritual Israel, that you are a Holy nation, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. My brother, you are peculiar. My sister, you are peculiar. See yourself as great. And number five, the Bible says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. That's your position. Your position in Christ is a position of authority, position of safety. Position of elevation. Why, why do you want to be? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. The Bible says, And had raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My sister, he has made you to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Far above principalities and powers. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that. 
because Christ is seated far above principalities and powers. And if we are seated with Christ, then we are far above principalities and powers. Why are you allowing principalities and powers to oppress you? Why? You shouldn't, and they shouldn't oppress you. They shouldn't be able to do anything to you because God is telling you that this is your identity in Christ. Why are you weeping every time? Oh God, look at my situation. What am I going to do now? You have authority. You have dominion. Rise. Where the word of the king is, there is power. Decree what you want. Say to this mountain, without removed, without cast into the sea, and it shall happen. You have authority. You can command. You can decree. You can, you, I mean, that's who you are. Live in your identity. All this weeping and crying, coming to a pastor, look at what has been happening to me for the last three, three, three weeks. I don't know where God is. God is where he has always been, sitting on his throne enjoying himself. He's giving you all that. It's because you don't know your identity. You don't know who you are. And the devil is pushing you around and messing you around like football, picking you around like football. But rise in your identity and let the devil know, I am here to exercise authority. I'm a regent of God. I'm a small part of this earth to exercise dominion, to exercise authority. I bind you from that place. Get out in the name of Jesus. He has made me a king and a priest. And I wear the word of the king is, there is power. Exercise your power. Exercise your dominion. Live in your identity. Then you will know, you know, many times you find Christians want to be like unbeliever. How do you want to? You, you will find sometimes a, a Christian, he wants to dress like Hollywood. These people are suffering. These people are, you know, they are dysfunctional. Go and look at Hollywood. Their marriages are collapsing every day. It is all about sleaze, you know, immorality. You know, this one marries this one, but is committing immorality with another one. Very dirty world. How do we want to be imitating all those? You have a great identity in Christ. My sister, you are the heir of God. You are a daughter of God. You are a joint heir with Christ. You are a queen. You are a priestess. You are seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. How can you bring yourself low and then you want to be like the people in the world? It's a shame. It's because you don't know who you are. But today, recover your identity in Christ. Recover who you are. See who God has made you to be. And then every form of dysfunctionality will vanish. You will be who God wants you to be. And I pray that the Lord himself, he will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What I've learned today, we have learned about recovering our Christian identity. And I pray that you will recover your Christian identity. Amen. When, who are thou, my son? You will not be Jacob calling yourself Esau. You will not be John the Baptist and say you are Christ. You will not be John the Baptist and say you are Elijah. You will not be John the Baptist. John the Baptist was so clear. I am not Christ. I am not Elijah. And I'm not one of the prophets. They know who are you. He told them who he, who he was. There is no shame. Be yourself. Don't have identity crisis. Be yourself. Be yourself. You know when people ask me, where are you from? I tell them the village I came from. And it's a village. So, but that's where I came from. I'm not going to say I will, I mean, I'm from Lagos. I was born in Lagos. I'm not from Lagos. You know, some people, they are ashamed of the village. Where are you ashamed? That's where you came from. It does not demean you. Just be who you are. I pray the Lord himself is going to help us. Today's Amen. message. Today's message. Don't pretend to be who you are not. It's an identity crisis. You don't have money today. That does not define your tomorrow. That's today's reality. But tomorrow, the Lord will bless you. Amen. Glory to God who elevates you. Amen. Amen. Where you are today does not define your tomorrow. You are going somewhere. 
Amen. Amen. Drama is sowing today, but he expects an harvest in the future. And then somebody says, hey, what? I mean, what do you have today? He said, I have abundance. You don't have abundance. You only have seed. Tell them, I have seed. I'm going to plant. But in a year's time, I expect a big harvest. There is nothing wrong in that. Don't be who, don't project who you are not. Be true to yourself. And when you are a real believer, it's easy. It's very easy because you are so proud of yourself. Proud to be a son of God. Proud to be a daughter of God. Proud to be an heir of God. Proud to be a joint heir with Christ. Proud to be, you know, a king or to proud or a king to, to God. Proud to be a queen unto God. Proud to be a priest unto God. Proud to be a priest unto God. Proud to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Who will not? That, that's, that's a great identity. That's your identity. Own that identity. Discover that identity. Recover that identity and live up to it. Let's rise up and pray. And tell the Lord and say, oh God, I will live up to my identity. I will have my I myself before you and before men who go home go Baba. go Baba. In the name of oh Lord, let me to be who I am. There's no second of me. Oh Lord, I pray to live with God, to have value to life with God. In the name of Jesus, I pray to live with God, to have value to life with God. In the name of Jesus, I pray to live with God, to have value to life with God. In the name of Jesus, I pray to live with God, to Discover your identity in Christ. Recover that identity. Discover and recover. Discover and recover. Discover and recover. Every day. to be a believer. Let all believers make you to feel inferior. My destiny, I will fulfill my life of God in the name of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit of God. God is everything, Papa. That I will not develop from the path of holiness, the path of the path of Jesus. Lord, I will not speak. That I will not sow my bed right to God for the sake of in the mighty name of God. I will not assume my faith to be God. To protect my people for the way you can do it. In the old life and God, in the mighty name of God. Lord, every form of ethnicity crisis to God will not be my portion. Will not be my portion. Lord, the world and this world will go about it. In your own image and likeness of Baba. Oh, God, I'm to separate myself from the poor, Baba. I will take all this and show you to go to the state. I will cover your identity in Christ. Saying that the world is so full 
of people with identity crisis. There's so much dysfunctionality in the world. A man is, a person is born a man, he wants to become a woman. He wants to dress like a woman. He wants to be a transvestite or a transgender. A man should marry a woman, but a man will marry a man. Said, I, I like to be gay. A woman will marry a woman. I like to be, to be, to, 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 to be lesbian. Identity crisis. They want to go against the against nature. What God says is natural, and it's because sin is at the root for big identity crisis. Who are you, my son? A Jacob will be asking and be so. But thank God for a person like John the Baptist. They asked him, "Who are you? Are you Jesus?" He said, "No." Are you Elijah? He said, "No." Are you that prophet that is to come? He said, no. Then who are you? Then he told them who he is. He was genuine. He was transparent. He was happy to be who he is. Oh Lord, help us to discover and recover our identity in Christ in Jesus' name. And Amen. help us to be happy to be who we are. Proud Amen. to be daughters of God. Proud to be kings and queens unto God. Proud to be priests and princes unto God. Proud to be heirs and uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Proud to be seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Oh God, help us to discover our great identity in Christ and to live up to it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's no basis for living a false life. Projecting who we are not, telling people what we are not. Oh Lord, help us that we will not live dysfunctional lives like, like people are living in the world. So many people, they are faking it. <coughs> they are faking it until they make it. No, we want to work until we make it. There's no need for faking anything. Oh Lord, help us to live like kings and queens on the earth, exercising authority and dominion. Instead of getting depressed, when there are challenges, we speak to the mountain. When there are challenges, we decree a thing and it is established unto us. When there are challenges, we command the mountain to shift and they must shift because that's who we are. Small gods in this world. Oh Lord, I pray that your people, as we discover our identity, our sisters, they are daughters of God. They will not go and be dressing like Jezebel, like the daughters of the devil in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have so many churches today that even, 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 the, even the pastor's wife, it's worse than Jezebel. They are, they are showing the goodness of God, the moral blessing. As part of our identity crisis, if you are a daughter of God, if you are a son of God, you will dress in a way that fits Jesus, in a way that, you know, protects integrity. I pray that the Lord himself will help us. Help Amen. us to rise Help us to live in the, in the identity of sons and daughters of God, in the identity of heirs and joint heirs with Christ, of the identity of priests and kings unto God. Oh Lord, help us to, to discover and to recover this identity in Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen.